Well, I think we'll get going here. So welcome, everybody. My name is Scott Swanson, and I am your host today for the Field of Fork, brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. This is our seventh year we've done this series, so we're glad you have joined us. Um, on the next slide, you will see uh, our final two webinars for the series. We're actually getting close to the end here. So um, on this next slide, there is, is it April 13th is Farm to School, and Getting Started and Best Practices. And that's with Londa from Kansas State and the University of Missouri and Anna, who is with South Dakota State. Uh, and then on April 20th is Preserving Food Safely, um, Home Food Preservation Update with Karen from Kansas State. And on the next slide, we show the webinar controls. For those that have been in most of these, you remember this fairly well. Um, we have a large number of people. So we have what, what's called we're using Zoom webinar. And so we actually ask that you uh, post your questions down there in the uh, chat area, comments and questions. And I'll read those to Jan at the end. So if you want, Let's go ahead and practice uh, using that chat box. A lot of people have already started it and you guys are uh, aware of it. Ones have been with us before. Go ahead and just chat down there. Throw down where you're, uh, where you're come joining us from, you know, your uh, city and state, if you can, down there in the chat area. Perfect. <clears throat> and while you're doing that, we'll go to the next slide because we have an acknowledgement. Um, it's a special request. This program is sponsored with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. So I'm going to ask all of you to complete a short online survey that I'll email that will be emailed right after today's webinar. I also will drop the link down in the chat, but I believe um, Bob helps us send out that email not too long after uh, the webinar is over. And after you complete that one, you will uh, possibly win a prize. Um, but, uh, Julie does have pr uh, prizes provided to the lucky winners uh, from a, through a random drawing. So be sure to complete your address on the, on the follow-up form, including city, state, and zip code. So again, welcome to today's webinar, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Janet Canodal is the professor and extension entomologist at North Dakota State University. For the past 23 years, she's provided statewide program leadership for extension entomology, the North Dakota, North Dakota Integrated Pest Management Program, and the NDSU Crop and Pest Report. Her extension outreach and applied research focuses on IPM and insect pests of field crops, including wheat, barley, canola, corn, chickpeas, dry beans, field peas, lentils, soybeans, and sunflower. She also studies pollinators, bees, and butterflies in gardens and field crops. So Jan, welcome to the Field of Fork. Here. Okay, great. Well, it's very nice to be here today, especially here in Fargo, North Dakota. We're having some terrible snow, sleet uh, weather. So it's kind of nice to think about uh, gardening and pollinators when we're getting this type of weather. We, we just seem to be holding on to winter here. <laughs> so most of you are aware of the, the importance of pollinators and honeybees. It's very important to our agriculture and natural ecosystems. In fact, over a third of the world's crop production depends on pollinators. And in agriculture crops, we mainly use honeybees about 80% for insect pollination on many of the fruit and vegetable crops. And honeybees themselves for their honey is uh, valued and for their pollination services, it's valued at uh, 20 to 30 billion in the US. And North Dakota is number one in honey production and just alone in North Dakota, our honey is valued at $61 million. So pollinators are very important. And I'm glad that all of us have joined this webinar so we can learn how to make our gardens more friendly for them. So unfortunately, first I have some uh, disappointing news uh, to report that uh, overall there's been a worldwide decline in bee, bee species. And this is some research that has been done by the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And they've been monitoring bees for a long time. And you can see here on the graph, this is the total number of bee species uh, and incidents. Let me bring up my laser pointer, okay. And you can see the yellow and the green lines are from 1950 to 1980. And the blue is 1990 and the purple's 2000. So you can see our diversity and richness 
has been fairly good up through the 1980s, 1990s, and then we started to see a shift in 2000. And unfortunately, this line has been decreasing quite dramatically now in 2010 and you know more recently. And this was recently published in One Earth. So we are seeing fewer bees uh, that were found between 20, 2006 and 2015 than before 1990. And you can see that in this graph where the estimated bee species richness, you can see it's significantly lower in 2010 compared to all the other years uh, mentioned, all the other decades. And despite increasing numbers of records, there's more and more uh, people interested in bees. Uh, there's a lot more observations being done. Even though we get more observations, the number of worldwide recorded bee species is sharply decreasing. And that's what you're seeing here in this graph. So, and global records are becoming increasingly more uneven over time, meaning there's hot spots where the bee diversity is really declining. And unfortunately, our favorite butterfly, the monarch, is also declining. I'm sure most of us have heard about this on the news. And it's been about 80% decline in the recent decades. And this is some information from the Center for Biological Diversity. And you can see, you know, it goes up and down a bit uh, depending on weather and other factors. But overall, it certainly has declined since 1997 to the more present. And there's a lot of reasons why. One of the major reasons has been the loss of milkweed, the host plant of the caterpillar, and also the overwintering sites. The particular species of monarch I'm referring to is the eastern one that overwinters in Mexico. And in Mexico, they're doing a lot of deforestation. So they're losing their overwintering sites to be able to overwinter successfully. Uh, they need you know, a certain number of trees in order to be protected from the freezing cold. And then there's pesticides. Uh, we all know uh, pesticides has certainly played a role in the loss of milkweeds through herbicide use in our field crops and agriculture, and also insecticides can negatively impact the uh, adult butterfly. And we'll talk a little more about this later. And then weather. Global warming also will probably play a major role in the decline of monarchs. So we've seen uh, recently a 53% decrease from previous seasons. And this is information from the Monarch Watch organization. There's a series of people that go out and do counts on the monarchs as they're migrating through. In fact, it's kind of fun to watch on their website um, to see when the monarchs will be coming up into North Dakota. Um, and you can see overall, overall, again, it's the same thing, you know, decline. And we are concerned about the monarch becoming an endangered species. And there's a movement or effort going on to bring back the monarchs. And this is legislation that could yield funding to help boost butterfly protection in the Xerce Society is the ones uh, that have been very supportive in getting this legislation through the Monarch Act of 2021. And it's already been introduced into both houses of Congress and it should provide about 25 million over the next five years to improve monarch habitats and planting of milkweed and conservation of their overwintering habitats. 
And one of the efforts we're doing here with the EIP uh, Extension Implementation Program is we're going to be monitoring uh, through four monarchs here in North Dakota. And we'll be looking uh, for the adult monarch butterfly. And then also, if you don't already have milkweed, we'll be planting milkweed for larval monitoring. And it's part of the Monarch Joint Adventure in the University of Wisconsin program. And we're gonna be implementing this through our master gardeners and extension agents who are interested. So as I'm collaborating with uh, Dr. Esther McGinnis, our extension horticulture on organizing this. And thanks to this funding from USDA NIFA EIP for this activity. And I, a lot of the information I'm gonna to cover today is available to you in these extension publications. And some of you probably already have them, uh, but um, if you don't, uh, you can get them as a color PDF by Googling NDSU and the title, Beautiful Landscapes and Butterfly Gardening. You should be able to find them. If you can't, just send me an email and I can send you the PDFs. So let's uh, get started. Um, planting a pollinator garden is uh, probably one of the funnest things I've done. Um, in my spare time. Uh, but just like buying a new house, one thing you should consider before you get started is location, location, location. Because not every site is suitable for pollinators. And in general, most of them like, you know, sheltered, uh, sunny locations, because we are fairly windy here in North Dakota. <laughs> um, and, you know, having a sheltered area is important for them. Uh, where they can feed without being uh, blown with a 40, 50 mile an hour wind. <laughs> so uh, habitat is, is number one. We got to provide them with food, our flowers, pollen and nectars. If, if you don't have the right flower, you might not get the right butterfly you want. Um, so, you know, a little knowledge about if you have a favorite butterfly, um, you know, read up on what that particular butterfly is attracted to for flowers. And the same with the caterpillars or the larvae. They have a different host than the adult butterfly. So read up too on the larvae, the other life stage. And then there's all different types of bees. And we'll talk a little bit, um, you know, some bees have short tongues, other bees have long tongues. So they like different types of flowers as well. And then the other thing that's very important is to provide it all season long, you know, early, mid, late season flowers. And I mentioned the shelter from winds. Uh, don't forget about bushes, trees. A lot of them also are host plants for caterpillars, uh, the butterflies. Um, so some, some of them, instead of going to flowers, go to trees or bushes. So, um, you know, plant bushes or trees that are attractive to the pollinators as well. Many of them have flowers. Basswood is a highly uh, concentrated nectar and many honeybees and other native bees just love basswood. Uh, so provide uh, watering sources as well. So these are the keys to having a good pollinator garden. And then last but not least is, you know, wise insecticide use, you know, even if you're going to use it at all. And we'll talk more about that later. So let's talk just a little bit about water sources first. Uh, you can use a bird bath, but a bird bath is usually two inches deep for water. So uh, for a uh, butterfly or a tiny halictid bee, a sweat bee, uh, you don't really want something that's that deep. You want more of a shallow uh, pan of water. And you'll have to refill it frequently in the summer when it's hot, uh, but they can drown easily. 
in a two inch deep bird bath. And yes, they can go on the side and get a little bit of water, but um, I found an awful lot of bees in my bird bath um, dead. Uh, so they really just need a shallow pan. You know, if it's a shady area, then you wouldn't have to fill it up as much. Uh, but butterflies like open areas of, of soil, sandy areas where they can just do what they call puddling because they like, they need the minerals in the soil. And uh, so just providing wet open areas where there's no grass, uh, a mud puddle. That's why we see them in country roads that are paved. Uh, oftentimes you'll see butterflies congregating on the gravel there and they're just collecting uh, water and minerals. Uh, then there's ponds and also butterfly feeders where you can actually feed uh, nectar and put in like slices of fruit, but be aware that also can attract hornets, um, which can sting you, especially in the fall when they get more aggressive. Then there's habitat we can provide. Well, this looks really nice, you know, having all these bees. These are for bees uh, that nest in tubes. You can put out posts and drill different size holes for different size of bees. And then also you can provide nice little houses and put these on the sides of your house. Here's a butterfly nesting box uh, where they can escape predators and go inside if it's bad weather, a, a thunderstorm you know, get out of the rain and the wind. Uh, so these are good, uh, but I just read a research paper on, you know, putting out, you know, doing a great big bee nesting housing unit or a hotel like here. And they found that these big units are usually not as successful for bee nesting bees. And that's because they also attract many of the predators that feed on these nesting bees in the tubes. So they found it was better to put out, you know, a smaller box and put out several of them rather than to put them all in one spot because then you're, you're, it's easy for your pre the predators to find the nesting bee larvae. And I've had trouble with woodpeckers getting into my nesting um, hotels. Um, and they just love the little bee larvae. <laughs> it's a tasty snack for them. And you can put up screening like, like here to prevent the woodpeckers from, you know, getting into the tubes and that sort of thing. So I, that's what I plan to do this year. Um, after I observed several different species of woodpeckers um, eating all my bees in the tubes. So anyway, um, also, uh, we talked about the bare ground for the uh, butterflies and then dead trees. Many of the butterfly caterpillars, they like decomposing trees or wood. And they actually, uh, well, that's what they'll feed on the decomposing wood as a caterpillar. Uh, so if you neighbors don't mind, you know, leave a dead tree. It's also good for woodpeckers. <laughs> And nesting, I'm a bird watcher as well. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I know sometimes uh, cities want them dead, but if you live out in the, uh, or uh, taken down, uh, but if you live out in the country, maybe you can leave a few dead trees up. And uh, then in the fall, let's be lazy in the fall. So don't cut down your perennials. Uh, there's stem nesting bees that will get into some of the perennials that we have. Again, uh, most of our bees are not stem nesters here in North Dakota, but um, still there's a few of them. So let's help them out. Um, any of those soft um, stems that are hollow in the middle um, are good. And so a little mess is good in the fall for those overwintering bees and butterfly caterpillars. And then um, choose, we kind of co covered this already, but just to reemphasize, this is very important. 
um, you know, choose a variety of plants. Just don't go with one because that only will probably bloom, you know, June, July. Uh, there's a few plants that bloom June through September, but usually you have to cut them back like um, uh, salvia and catnip, nepta. Um, those you can cut back and they'll usually rebloom. But a lot of the perennials, especially the native ones, uh, will not. And then incorporate some natives into your garden. Um, they evolved with our bees and our butterflies. So a lot of them actually provide very good uh, nectar and pollen sources. And like the reverse migration of the monarch is very closely tuned to the uh, Leatris blazing star that's blooming that time of year. <clears throat> and remember, um, uh, there's several non-native species but um, of bees, but they may be beneficial as well. And also uh, it's good rather just planting one plant, plant a lot, three or more, you know, try to get a large grouping because if you have just one lone plant, um, it may not do well, so it might not attract as many bees. Um, you know, so if you have multiple in an area, it's, it's just better for attracting. And then be careful, you're not selecting flowers without nectar. A lot of the cultivated ornamentals now to look pretty, uh, they've given up on some of the pollen and nectar and made some of the reproductive organs into another set of petals, like you see here. And so this is no food value at all for the pollinators. So choose, this is a native echinacea here, the purple cone flower. So choose uh, something that is good for them. I mean, if you really love one of those, you could put one in, <laughs> but I would plant a lot of them. And then there's this whole debate now about native versus cultivars and a non-native flower. And uh, a lot of people are kind of reluctant to try native flowers because they, well, let's face it, they might be less attractive, weedy, or more likely to lodge. Uh, here, for example, is the aster. This is the New England aster. Uh, it's a native. It's about four feet tall, and you can see it's lodging. So, this one would definitely, if you have it in your garden, and I have like several of them, I always stake them every year. Otherwise the wind will blow them over. They're meant to be in a natural setting where there's a lot of grass and other flowers close together that support them. So when we put them into our gardens and we have spacing uh, to give them room to grow, uh, sometimes, you know, they're not gonna stand up as well. Uh, but the ornamental uh, cultivars, unfortunately, in the breeding process, some of them lost some of their traits that are attractive to pollinators, like little or nectar pollen. And here's a uh, cultivar, um, same species as our native one, uh, Purple Dome. Um, that's a fairly good uh, pollinator one. And also I talked a little bit about mouth parts. Uh, some of the uh, cultivated varieties might not be adapted um, with, for our bees with different mouth parts. So some of the native flowers are, for example, shallow nectar reserves, asters or milkweeds. You know, that needs a smaller bee like you see here. This is agapostamon. And um, butterflies, you would also be a smaller butterfly, like a hair streak. They have the shorter tongues. So they're gonna go to these types of flowers. And then others have deeper nectar reserves, like our bee balm. And they are the bigger uh, bees, like bumblebees, and the bigger butterflies, like the swallowtails. 
that you see in the picture there that have the longer tongues. Um, so that's why it's good also to provide a variety of, of flowers if you can. So plan a big pollinator garden. <laughs> So we've actually done some research on this uh, pollinator preference. Um, we did it in collaboration with uh, Esther McGinnis, uh, Barb Lachowicz, uh, Harleen hatterman Valenti, and then I had a postdoc who got her PhD under me, Veronica Kellez Torres. Um, and we got funding through the North Dakota Department of Ag to do this research. And we looked at um, asters, false indigo, bee balm, and sedums. We looked at only the tall sedums, not the small uh, creeping ones. And we had eight uh, native species and 20 ornamental cultivator, cult, cultivars. And we uh, worked in Fargo at the Hort Garden on 12th Avenue and 18th there, where you come into campus. And then out at Absaractra, horticulture research area. Uh, so we were in South um, East North Dakota. Now we did put together a extension club on this and I'll extract some of the information, but you might wanna also download this one um, to get more information than what I have time to cover today. Um, also, we have a peer reviewed paper that's uh, gonna be coming out as well. So um, here, this one is for Aster, and we did ratings. We, Veronica uh, sat by each flower and did observations on bees, surfed flies or hoover flies, which is a beneficial uh, pollinator. And as a larvae, it uh, is a voracious predator of aphids and many other soft-bodied insect pests. And then we also recorded uh, butterflies. Um, <clears throat> and then here's the column for native or cultivar. And then here's the blue bean time when it was in bloom. And she sat by the flowers for about um, uh, three minutes each and did observations and recorded the bees, surfed flies and butterflies and also collected them. And when we, did uh, identification, Patrick Bose did the identification on the bees, surfer flies and butterflies. If we usually the butterflies we didn't need to collect because they're for, easier to identify and larger than bees. Um, so we had the yellow ones here are the native. So we had the New England aster and the aromic aster. And then all the others were cultivated. Oh, oh, there's one down here too, um, smooth blue. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, but anyway, the number of bees indicate how popular it was or visited. Uh, so the more, if there's only one bee, it was low. If there was two, it was moderate. If there's three, it was high. If there's four, it was very high. Uh, so this is, this is based on our counts that we did. Um, <clears throat> and the same for the surfer flies and butterflies. Uh, so you can see here, this native one was quite popular um, with the bees and the surfer flies. And if we compare it to the same species but cultivated varieties, uh, you can see the, the Alma per Pachishki, uh, did fairly well, but this purple dome one didn't do quite as well, didn't have quite as many. And also this could be due to its shorter bloom time. Uh, this one blooms a little bit later. And sometimes in North Dakota, if we get an early frost, um, you know, the asters can be done, you know, in September. But if, lately we've been having a really nice uh, longer fall. So it's been good to have the asters. Uh, here's another native, and this one didn't attract as many. Um, and then there's several other uh, species that are cultivars here. October Skies, uh, Dream of Beauty, and then also Radon's favorite. 
Um, so this one, um, actually some of the cultivars did better in our study. And here at the bottom, smooth blue aster. So then we also did total counts of the pollinators and the bees are in black, the surfeit flies in yellow, and then the butterflies in orange. And uh, we did this study for about uh, two, three years. So uh, here again, you can see the, um, the natives here. This one at the top too should have been highlighted. Sorry about that. But you can see the one here on the bottom, the New England aster native one had the highest number overall. And so it's not always true that the natives attract more pollinators than what we found here with the asters. Some of the asters that are cultivars did, you know, fairly good. And I just thought you'd be interested in some pictures. That uh, was fun work because you're dealing with these beautiful flowers. Again, this is the native one that's real tall, would need to be staked in your garden and put it in the back. Um, and then here's another native <clears throat> and the dream of beauty, which is a beautiful pink one. And there's more information about each variety and so forth in the publication. So, and here's the sedums. Uh, you can see all of them are cultivars. And some of the common ones are Autumn Joy and then the new release of Autumn Joy, Autumn Fire, uh, Mr. Goodbud. Um, you probably recognize some of these. And uh, Autumn Joy and Autumn Fire and Night Embers uh, was our top, these are our top three. So, and they were blooming in August through, or yeah, August through September. So let's see if autumn fire and joy and night embers holds true for the numbers. And yes, autumn joy and fire had the highest total counts of pollinators. And here's night embers, number three. Uh, so, you know, this was a lot of work that went into this research, but it's good information especially if you want to plant varieties that are very attractive to pollinators. And here's some pictures, just gorgeous. This is the painted lady butterfly. Uh, Mr. Goodbug uh, didn't do quite as well on the heavy clay soil here in the valley, uh, but I live out in Holly on some sandy loam and my Mr. Goodbug is doing really good. So this one likes good drainage and a little bit more sandy soil. And then here we have the Moderna. Uh, here's the native ones, uh, wild bergamot and the spotted bee balm. And you can see, uh, again, this is a very attractive plant uh, for those long tongue bees. Um, <clears throat> and these were, you know, pretty good. Didn't attract as many butterflies. But um, we also got some good results with the cultivars here. Uh, Grand Parade, Marshall Delight, Purple Mildew Resistant, and Raspberry Wine. I just love these names. And some of them are fairly long blooming. Um, I like, like that because then you don't have to, you know, cut them back or have a whole bunch of other plants. So this one bloomed July through September. So again, um, there's not a whole lot of difference here um, with the natives compared to the non-natives. Um, again, yes, uh, Fistula uh, had the highest, the wild bergamot. Uh, Punctata is the spotted one. And here's some pictures of the two native ones. This one's just a really interesting flower. I, Tried to grow it um, in my garden, but it's fairly short lived. So if you do grow it, I recommend that you let it go to seed because it will need to reseed itself. Um, here's the purple resistant one with a skipper moth on it. 
And our conclusion from this study was that, you know, both ornamental cultivars can be beneficial as well as the native plants. So we recommend that you integrate both into your pollinator gardens and that might help improve the aesthetics, you know, how it looks as well as attract and nourish our pollinators. So let's get to the flowers. Um, here's some spring flowers um, that we can plant. Uh, these are crocuses are just my favorite and I love to plant them. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I've been known to go out in the fall and plant hundreds of them. You can put them right into your grass if you want. And uh, Siberian squeal too is a great one, very hardy. Uh, let me explain the uh, table here. Uh, B is for B. Uh, BF down here is for butterfly and H is for hummingbird. So this tells you like the bottom one here, red columbine attracts all three. Um, <clears throat> so then there's comments over here um, and these tables are in the uh, B uh, poll pollinator uh, publication. Um, so this is a great source because the queen hum uh, bumblebees uh, wanna come out early. Uh, before a lot of flowers are out. So this is the first thing we see in the spring. Um, so, you know, planting these bulbs can be a lifesaver to the queen bumblebee. And here's some of the native ones here, uh, shown by the X here in the native column. Um, this one is just beautiful. You can buy a uh, bare root now. You can't dig them up but you can find places that sell the bare root and plant the bare root and get these flowers going in your gardens. Um, I love this one. I have this one everywhere, prairie smoke. It's just beautiful um, and it even looks good after it's done flowering. It uh, has those feathery seed heads and you can just leave them on for the rest of the summer. Uh, and they're actually quite attractive. Okay, here's some pictures. I had to put pictures in, of course. <laughs> and here's my favorite, the crocus, and then the past flowers. Columbine is great as well. Uh, June flowers. It's Golden Alexander is a must. You must have that one. <laughs> um, it's very good for bumblebees and, and butterflies. And it's made, I've actually got it to go into July a little bit too. Um, it looks like deal, um, but it's actually a beautiful plant in the garden. It just gets very full. It's not aggressive. It keeps a nice round shape. And uh, it's also a host plant of the swallowtail, the black swallowtail butterfly, which is one of my favorites. Um, and because it's one of my favorites, I like to plant the hose for the caterpillar as well as the flowers for the butterfly. We'll talk more about the milkweed for the monarch. Um, again, this is the orange one. This one is not native in North Dakota, but it is native more out east and South Dakota and Minnesota. It is naturally growing out in the wild. <clears throat> Again, uh, this one doesn't like the, uh, the tuberosa, doesn't like the wet soils. And then false indigo, Baptisia. Uh, this is great for your bumblebees. Uh, they have kind of a closed flower, so only the big, strong bumblebee can make its way into that flower. So again, this is a lifesaver for that queen bumblebee. And then catnip and salvia, two of my favorite perennials, very hardy. They always come back every year um, and they're attractive to bees and butterflies. I get butterflies on my cat, catnip as well, nepta. A walker's low is a good variety. Um, it's actually uh, quite big. This is the, uh, not a description of it. This is a description of the 
garden it was developed at Walker Slow. Um, but uh, there's a lot of new salvia coming out. Um, so try some of the newer varieties. Um, they have some that have lar larger flowers on them. And I've seen bumblebees um, at many of the, uh, like midnight, um, what many of the newer varieties. So here's just some pictures. This is uh, the golden Alexander. And yes, it's early. And it's a lifesaver for that queen bumblebee. And chives, I got some chives I put in actually for eating, but I found out that they were excellent flowers and the butterflies and bees love them. So summer flowers, um, purple prairie clover. This one is easy to grow and you don't even have to buy the expensive plants in the pots if you don't want. You can just get seed and seed it. It's very easy to seed. It doesn't require a cold uh, overwintering stamp uh, to get it to grow. Um, and it's a great uh, landing pad for butterflies. So if you don't have this in, you know, it's very neat too. It keeps a nice little circle. Um, it's only about 15 inches high or so and about 15 inches wide. So it's kind of a nice plant. You could put it as an ed edger really. Uh, swamp milkweed is excellent um, <clears throat> for bees and butterflies. Oh, I see, I'm not, I might have to speed up here. Um, and it grows well. It, a lot of people think you need really wet soil for it, but I grow it in a dry spot <laughs> and it's doing great. Um, I water it during a drought, of course, but um, I don't think it needs as moist of a soil. I mean, to get it going, you'd want to water it, you know, maybe every week. But after it's established, mine are doing great in the dry soil. Uh, Black-eyed Susan, uh, Liatris, again, great for butterflies and hummingbirds, too. Purple cone flowers, uh, this is another one you must have. <laughs> I may want to double the size of your garden because <laughs> once you start looking at all these beautiful flowers you realize you want you know you want to try that one and that one and it just gets going it's quite big um uh, i started just a couple and now i have about 10 gardens or more <laughs> um so anyway yeah bee balm we kind of covered that uh the fistulosa uh, that's that wild bergamot is another name. Hyssop, you must have that. That is just fantastic attraction for everything. And it's really easy to grow and it's it's gorgeous. It's fairly tall. Uh, so you you put it either in the middle, you know, if you go have a tall garden from the middle going less height or in the back. A uh, culver's root, that one is also great for vertical accent, but it likes it a little moist. A uh, joe pie weed, uh, the butterflies just love this in the fall. A uh, very important food so source for them, just covered with butterflies. Again, it says moist, moist soils, but I got mine in a dry spot. So um, <laughs> I do mulch though with wood chips. Um, and then the metal blazing star, the favorite of the monarch. If you want monarchs, you must plant this one. It's very tall, four to five feet, so you'll need to stake it. Put it on large uh, groups. They only um, grow about 12 inches wide for spacing, so you can put a lot of them in a small amount of area. Uh, mid flowers, I uh, got a lot of hyssops and you know, these are all good. These aren't native, but Russian sage is very attractive. Uh, sunflower, a must. You know, put that in your garden where you're growing your vegetable crops and, you know, you'll have some good uh, pollinators that'll come in there and pollinate your squash and pumpkins. And fall flowers. I think I mentioned how important they are. They're very, very important um, for those Butterflies that do reverse migrations, the bees need, need to build up energy reserves for overwintering in their nest and soil. 
Um, <clears throat> so stiff goldenrod, this is one I just love. Um, it's a native one and it's very, it's, it's large, but it stays in its area and it's just gorgeous. Uh, tall sedum, uh, New England asters, we kind of talked about them. A lot of these pictures are from my uh, garden. Uh, and then there's a lot of, don't forget about the annuals. I use these to fill in between my perennials. And uh, my favorites are zinnias, but don't plant the doubles. They don't have any nutrient uh, nectar available. So, and lantana are my, and cosmos. So, and elysium. So I got a lot of favorites. And then the herbs too. I plant deal. I just let it go to seed and it comes back every year. So I don't have to replant it. And it's one of my favorites because my favorite butterfly is the black swallowtail. And this is the caterpillar. And it was on my deal, um, which is the host of the caterpillar. Uh, so, you know, deal lavender. I always plant lavender as well. That's just a good all around. Plus, it smells so good. So put it close to where you'll be sitting on the patio. And then milkweeds. There's a lot of different species of milkweeds. Um, <clears throat> this is the one we already talked about, tuberosa, the orange one. Uh, but this kind of gives you an idea what types of soils they do best in. And the common milkweed, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, world milkweed, I got, this one is nice. I have this one, it's a smaller one. A swamp milkweed is by far my favorite. And it doesn't really need as moist soils as you think. It'll do good in moist soils as well, but I was surprised how well it's doing in my dry soils. And I got the showy milkweed too. Um, I also made the mistake, I think, of planting common milkweed because it's so aggressive. And it is a noxious weed in Cavalier, Renville, Sheridan, Trail, and Wells County. But it's not on the state noxious weed list, so you can plant it. But it's not the best choice. Um, if you want it to stay in a certain spot, it's definitely not going to stay there. Your swamp milkweed is the better choice. And don't forget about grasses. Uh, grasses are the host for many of the caterpillars of the butterflies and moths. For example, little blue stem is one of my favorites, and it's a host for nine skipper moths, including the endangered Dakota skipper and the common wood nymph that you see here. So don't forget about putting in some grass. Um, I know it doesn't have a beautiful flower on it, but very important if you want the, ant, the insect to complete its whole life cycle in your gardens. So in the butterfly fact sheet, we got um, a list for all the different butterflies. This is just part of it. And it shows you what they feed on, you know, early, mid, and late. So let's black swallowtail, my favorite. Um, you know, phlox, bee, bee balm, sunflower, thistle, milkweed, alfalfa. You know, so I'm gonna put these in my garden, maybe not alfalfa, but. <laughs> Definitely zinnias, because I want to see this flying around when I'm out working in my garden. So in here again, uh, this black swallowtail, my favorite, dill, heartleaf alexander, you know, it's also called the parsley worm because it likes dill, parsley, and carrots. So a lot of the uh, caterpillars might look like pests to you, so be kind of careful. Um, you know, this spiny guy here is the red admiral butterfly. Um, so before you get reach for that insecticide, you know, you might want to take some time to identify that caterpillar. And seasonal calendars is also available on the fact sheet. You know, when do I expect to see my black swallowtail? Um, might come in in May and then it's common in July. And then just a little bit, I'm going to end here on pesticide use. Um, 
about um, a third of the honeybee colonies are dying. And that also includes, we don't have as good data for native and bees and bumblebees, but we know they're dying as well. Monarchs are declining. And a lot of this is due to our pesticide use and agriculture. And bees and insects are exposed through foliar sprays. And then with seed treatments as they're planting and going through the planting the machine, the dust gets scraped off of the insecticide seed treatment and then it can move long distances we found in our research. And it can end up on that dandelion that is feeding that early season bumblebee queen and killer. Uh, it can also contaminate water and if there's any flowering weeds or it, if you're close to, you know, you live out in the country, um, it could get into your garden. And just be aware, bees are extremely sensitive to the neonicotinoid group 4A. So do not use these at all on any of your flowers. So look for 4A, it should be on the label. That tells you what group of insecticide it belongs to. And if you see this label, this is on all the neonicotinoid labels. That means it's highly toxic to bees and you won't want to use it in your garden. So try to select short residual pesticides that are selective to certain pests like aphids, or you can use like Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, Kerstachii, for any caterpillar that might be a pest. So we're trying to reduce the impact on our non-targets, our pollinators, and then limit any broad spectrum or systemic insecticides that are translocated through the plant. If it's systemic, like the neonicotinoids, it can move up and get into the pollen and nectar. And of course, don't spray when it's windy um, <laughs> because then you're gonna get drift and or an inversion. For solutions, again, uh, dust are very bad. The dust can, bees are very ha hairy and um, that can be, the dust can glue onto their hair. That's how they collect pollen. And so use more liquid. Fortunately, a lot of the insecticide formulations come pre-mixed for homeowners. So that's what I would encourage you to use is some of those pre-mix if you have to spray for insect pest. And again, um, avoid, you know, you know, don't spray during peak bloom when all your flowers are blooming. Uh, but if there's actually a flower or a plant that's being attacked by a insect pest and it's gonna happen because it's happened to me and I've had to spray even though I didn't want, I went out very late in the evening, that is the preferred time, um, you know, like nine, 10 o'clock. So all the bees are back in their hives, butterflies aren't active then, they're just daytime flyers. And I wait to see if the temperature gets cool, but sometimes in the summer, it doesn't get that cold below 50 or 55. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just remember if, if it's real hot in the 90s, like we were last year, uh, bees and butterflies will be foraging a little bit earlier and they'll also continue a little bit longer into the evening. So just be aware of that and, you know, spray as late as you can. And here's some pollinator extension resources that have been developed over the years. So, you know, these are for you. So be sure that you use them if you're interested. There's one on endangered pollinators of North Dakota and insects that look like bees. And we already talked about these three. And don't forget there's excellent resources out there. I got these two books from Xerces uh, recently and they're great. So if you're wondering what to plant for your favorite bee or, your, or for monarchs, Go ahead, uh, buy these books, they're not that expensive. And the Xerces does an awful lot for pollinators. So check out their website. And that's all I have, sorry I ran a little bit long.
Well, thanks, Jan. That was great. Um, and we started a couple of minutes late, so no big deal. Okay. <laughs> We'll try to get a few questions in or maybe all of them. There's a, a, a decent number of them here in the chat. So we'll just start rolling on through. Okay. Um, first one came from Daniel and he says he likes to show sunflowers at the county fair. And he, if he has bug damage on the sunflowers, he cannot exhibit them. So how can he get rid of the damaging insects without hurting the bees? Well, you're probably going to have to plant um, a lot. <laughs> Of sunflowers and select ones that have the least amount of damage. Sunflowers are native to North America and so because of that they do have a lot of insect pests. They evolved with the sunflowers. So um, there's not a whole lot unless you go on a spray insecticides. Um, you're, I mean some of the pests that go after sunflowers are can destroy the head and uh, get into the seed. Um, you could, uh, this would affect the pollinators so well, but there is netting bags that you can put over heads to protect them, but then the pollinators wouldn't be able to get them. But um, there really isn't a good uh, way to do that unless you can plant a lot of certain varieties the ones on the, it, many of the insects are edge pest, so they only get into the edges, mm -hmm. most concentrated. So maybe you can plant like a trap crop around the outer edge of your field that you don't want, you know, you're not concerned. So that will help you trap most of the insect pests. And then the ones on the inside usually have um, fewer pests of sunflower many of them are edge insects so that sounds good yeah. um Kelsey's wondering how can she set up a bird bath to be a water source for the pollinators but not a breeding ground for the mosquitoes uh, well you should clean your bird bath every day and uh, then it won't be a problem for mosquitoes and what i've done in my bird bath is uh, depends how big your bird bath is, but mine is like fairly big. It's 20 inches wide or so. And I put a big flat rock that goes above the water in the middle. And then the birds can still get in around the side and, and take a bath, uh, unless it's a real big bird. <laughs> but um, um, anyway, uh, yeah, that helps because then the bees and the butterflies, well, they like the rock a flat rock and they can go to the water then and drink without drowning. That makes but, sense. Yeah. Good. But you should um, change it every day yeah, to prevent the mosquitoes from breeding. Good deal. Change it every day. Uh, all right. So Levon is wondering, um, when is the best time to clean our gardens as to not endanger the bees that might be hibernating in the grass and leaves? I just wait till spring. <laughs> I enjoy my fall and I actually like looking at the flower heads throughout the winter because um, I'm also a bird nut. So <laughs> it's amazing how many birds like to feed on the flowers, heads of, especially the native uh, flowers, perennials. All right. Um, Ginger's wondering, how do we know the flowers without nectar before buying them? Um, you don't. Um, uh, you can read about what they say in the description. Uh, sometimes they'll say, um, uh, you know, good for bees or good for butterflies. So then you're pretty much assured. Uh, but if you see a double petal, any double petals are not good. Okay. Like that one cone flower where it had the, the petals on the edge, which were larger. And then on the dome, it had the shorter petals. Um, that's a double pet. Uh, that's one form of a double petal. And then you can also get double petals everywhere throughout the flower head. Don't buy those. Those are the ones that have been modified. So, and some of the reproductive parts that would be nectar and pollen have gone to the development of more petals. Okay. Uh, Alexis is wondering if you could speak a little bit on hummingbirds. Are they common in Western North Dakota? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, we only get one species, so, um, well, we could get some migrants, but uh, I put out a lot of uh, 
hummingbird feeders as well. And uh, we get the ruby-throated uh, hummingbird. But during migration, you could get, sometimes they get blown off course if there's a storm. You could get an Anna's hummingbird or, you know, anything exciting. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun to watch the hummingbirds. Don't put the feeders um, too close to your window. Uh, you want to keep them a little bit away uh, from the window um, so they don't smash into it. <laughs> yeah. Is the skipper a moth or a butterfly? It's a moth. Yeah, it looks like a butterfly, but it's a, a beautiful uh, moth. Okay. Does BT kill monarch butterflies? Um, well, if I didn't know if you're talking about the BT inside corn, that's genetic engineering. And that is, you know, protect is inside the plant. And the only way you're going to get it is if you're a larvae chewing, like European corn borer inside that plant or corn rootworm feeding on the roots. Um, but if the monarch, there's been studies done, the monarch uh, butterfly feeding on the pollen of corn during pollination will not be affected because they have they have control over where, whether these BT genes are released in the plant. So like for corn rootworm, it's just the roots. For corn borer, it's just the stalk and, and the leaves, not the pollen or the, well, it doesn't produce much nectar, but uh, but not on the pollen. So, so we can control where it's at. But for the BT that you buy over the counter, like Dipel and spray, yes, um, it can kill any true caterpillar that has, a true caterpillar is one that has two to five abdominal prolates. A lot of people get soft fly larvae, for example, have six or more prolates, and they look like a caterpillar, but they're not. Um, they're not a true caterpillar. So BT won't kill them. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, our, our butterflies and moths, um, it will kill all caterpillar stage. And it acts as a, it has to be ingested though. So it has to be a caterpillar. And usually the young stages are the preferred time to spray. And then eventually it causes the gut to rupture and then they die. But that's kind of a long wind uh, <laughs> answer, I guess. <laughs> There's just a couple of more here. Phil, I don't know. Okay. This, this might be a tricky one to try to answer, but Phil is wondering if there's a hope to develop a nationwide interstate highway system habitat for monarch and bee pollinators. Oh, that, well, oh, I, I thought you were telling me there is. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I wish there, there was. Um, I know there's some efforts to get some of that going. You know, I drive down Interstate 94, the main road going east to west of North Dakota. And, you know, I, all I think of is, oh, this would be beautiful habitat to have flowers all the way when you go to Bismarck and <laughs> yeah but yeah there's a lot of land out there but they do use that for hay for the cattle so it's usually hay you know for the cattle so but we still could have just um you know a narrow um section or maybe certain areas just around certain areas have corridors where we could yeah. plant no I would love in fact, I talked at the uh, uh, Weed Control Association out in Bismarck this uh, winter, and I actually suggested that to them that they plant um, pollinator corridors along our highways because a lot of these butterflies, they starve to death because they can't find enough flowers. And if we had these corridors, they would be able to survive and travel and move around at the same time. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's uh, like two more here. How, lo uh, how long should the straws be for bee nesting boxes with mesh? And then what is the best mesh for the nesting boxes for bees, a quarter or a half? Um, I would, you to prevent the hunt, the woodpeckers from getting in, I assume is what you're, I would assume uh, he didn't yeah, say. It, I six. So. Uh, you can buy the tubes. Uh, they're about six inches long, 
And there's different sizes for different size bees. Uh, we don't have very many bees that would, uh, nesting two bees that uh, would use the great big ones that are half inch. Um, so most of ours would be, I think it's, yeah, quarter inch. Okay. And then if you want to put, put a protected house screen um, on the outside to protect, you know, have it come out a little bit so it's away from the entrance of the tube. And then you'd want to use at least a quarter inch so the bees can get through. No, that's good. Um, there's a couple in the Q&A that I'm going to ask quick. First uh, is just a comment, uh, Mary. I, I do see um, yours in there. She's a Becker County Master Gardener, and she's interested in the Monarch program. So I'm going to send you... Okay. I'll send you her email. She threw it in there. Okay, thank um, you. I'll pass it along. And then two quick ones. Um, somebody's wondering about effective homemade insecticide options. Well, uh, you mean like botanicals? Um, there's really isn't very many <laughs> that I can think of. Um, we don't really recommend uh, the homemade insecticide soap anymore because the stuff you buy at the store puts in too many perfumes um, and other chemicals that um, could cause phytotoxic reaction on plants and reduce their effectiveness. So we recommend that you buy the commercial stuff like safer insecticidal soap um, that doesn't have those perfumes and dyes in there that will negatively affect the performance of the chemical. Um, I, I know there's some things that, you know, they're supposed to work, um, but I don't think they're very effective. So if you had high numbers of the pest, um, most likely you're going to eventually, it might repel them. There's some like things that repel certain pests. Um, <clears throat> trying to think of something um, like garlic. Um, some people have used garlic and sprayed that on plants and things, but um, I think you're better off going with a bio rationale, which includes, you know, botanical insecticides, uh, microbial, like the BT and um, uh, what's the other one? Um, botanical, but like neem seed extract, that's from a plant um, that's grown in India, the neem tree. And um, you can buy that in pre mixed bottles so you don't have to bother with mixing it to, it's all ready for you to go. Uh, there is protective screenings you can put over um, like garden plants, but then that might also impact uh, the pollinators if they, you know, can't, if it doesn't have like a screen hole where it's big enough for them to get through. And I've, I've used some uh, chicken wire to prevent deer from eating some of my flowers. And I've noticed the, wherever I had the chicken wire and stuff, um, that seems to disturb the bumblebees and the butterflies. They don't like that on there. So, uh, but I can't really think of a good <laughs> thing you could put there. Soap, um, well, I know that's for deer more, but um, you can buy that real smelly soap um, and hang it on shrubs and things you don't want the deer eating. It works to some extent, but <laughs> it's right. still well, not 100%. Sure. There's one last one and we might have to do a little search and or maybe throw something in the chat, a link here if we can think of one, but um, somebody's asking, where can they find information that you shared about the most careful, less harmful methods of using insecticides? Is there like a website? Uh, is there something um, mentioned I, I, can maybe I did do in? a video on that a while back. It's an older video. Um, well, first off, all synthetic insecticides that are commercially made they're made to kill insects. Um, all of our pollinators are insects. So if you can just think of them, they're all toxic. They're going to kill ins or your bumblebees and your bees and butterflies. Um, if you spray them, 
what I do is when I got, like I had a real bad infestation of lace bugs last year, it was on my salvia, my nepta, and they were, they were killing the plants. So I had to do something. Uh, so what I did is I just went out at night <clears throat> and sprayed, very spot treated just the plants I had to. And they're most commonly found on the undersides of the leaves. So, you know, I'm treating that. And I don't treat the flowers or if it's flowering, I'll cut it off if I have to go very high up. So as long as that insecticide dries before the bee, you know, comes and lands on the leaves or the butterfly, after it dries, it's much safer. So you're most concerned when it's wet. So do it in the late evening. Um, by morning, it will be dry. <laughs> Perfect. Well, if anybody else had any other questions or maybe they didn't want to follow up with something they had uh, or that we talked about, obviously there's Jan's email address. You guys can reach out to her that way if you want, if um, that is it. And thanks for staying on a little longer, people. We went a little longer with all the questions and started a little late, but uh, thank you, Jan, for the great presentation, for answering all our questions. Yeah, thank you and have a great day and thanks, Frank. Mm -hmm.